Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. My name is Todd Davidson. I'm the CEO at Travel Oregon. We're the state's destination management organization. I'm pleased to be able to join you today with my co-host, Jason Branch, who is the president and CEO of the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association. And together, we're excited to be able to bring you this opportunity to partner with the Oregon Business Plan to put together this tourism industry cluster session and spend the next hour with you and this group of tourism industry leaders that have volunteered their time to be able to be here with us today to discuss the direct impacts of COVID-19 on Oregon's tourism economy and how the industry can really position itself best for a recovery. This panel discussion is the last one that's going to be held in the series of cluster sessions in anticipation of the release of the Oregon Business Plan on December 14th at 1 p.m. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Jason, my co-host, to introduce himself and the members of our panel. Great. Thank you so much, Todd. Uh, again, my name is Jason Brand. I serve as the president and CEO of the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association. Uh, before COVID, we had you know over 10,000 food service locations in Oregon, 2,500 lodging operations. About one in five typically are voluntary members of our organization. And of course, in times like these, we take it very seriously. We want we want to make sure we're saving as many restaurant and lodging operations as possible and help them hang on long enough for that vaccine to be widely distributed to bring back that consumer confidence that we all care so much about. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure working with Todd on a regular basis and all the professional staff at Travel Oregon, as well as all of the folks that are uh, joining you as panelists today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of our, our panelists and we'll go through the self introduction, starting with Mr. David Pendleton. Hello, I'm David Pendleton with the Culinary America's Hub World Tours. Uh, we've been in business since 2007 and looking forward to participating today. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Conway. I'm Chief Strategy Officer with Travel Portland. Really glad to be here with the other panelists today. Um, Travel Portland is the destination management and marketing organization for Portland. And I will kick it over to Patrick to introduce himself. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Megan. Hey, Patrick Nofield, Escape Lodging Company. We're based in Cannon Beach, Oregon. We're a property operations company, but we also do quite a bit of development on the hotel side. We've got properties in Seaside, Cannon Beach, um, the Dalles, Oregon, Richland, Washington, and uh, recently opened a hotel in Beaverton. Nice to be here. Thank you. Erin? Hi, my name is Erin Stevenson. I'm the founder and co-owner of uh, Third Street Flats and the Atticus Hotel. We opened our first location in 2009 and uh, grew to another with our Third Street Flats brand. And then in 2018, opened the Atticus Hotel, uh, all three in downtown McMinnville. And uh, I also am the chair of the board of Visit McMinnville, our destination uh, management organization for our community. Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us here today. And Jason, thank you for not just co-hosting this panel with us today, but for the ongoing collaboration. The partnership that we have with the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association is obviously one that, that we cherish. It's one that's important to us as the as a statewide uh, tourism destination management organization for the state of Oregon. To be able to work closely with you is, uh, is a real privilege. So again, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us here today. You know, no surprise, tourism is a significant part of Oregon's economy. Uh, in 2019, we became a $12.8 billion industry and we're employing over 117,000 Oregonians. Uh, it was our 10th consecutive year of strong, solid growth. And while many may look at the travel and tourism industry as being made up of multi-billion dollar multinational corporations, our panel speaks for itself, right? We are really an industry of entrepreneurs. We're an industry of small businesses. Uh, probably 70, 75, 80% of the businesses in Oregon's travel and tourism industry are indeed sole proprietorship, where the owner's showing up every morning and unlocking that front door and making those transactions and experiences happen with visitors from around the world. You know, Oregon's a destination for both overnight visitors and of course day travelers. You know, Oregonians love to vacation in, in their state and that Oregon experience is rich and it's diverse. We've got natural landscapes. We have interesting cultures and the food scene with the wines and the craft beers and the produce here is pretty, um, pretty, pretty doggone amazing. But COVID-19 has had 
an immediate and devastating impact on the travel and tourism industry. At the national level, you know, air travel demand plummeted. Here at PDX alone, we saw 95% uh, decreases in, in air travel, a uh, number of passengers flowing through uh, PDX, and they're not anticipated to get back to global levels now, you know, when you look at all airlines, not, they're not expected to get back to global levels until 2024. But we do know visitors are looking for wide open spaces. They're looking for perhaps uh, vacation experiences that are going to be a little closer to home. You know, we do know that over 40% of Americans right now are feeling comfortable about getting out for leisure activities within their own communities. And we also know that the latest vaccine news is really encouraging. Uh, in fact, fully over 58% of American travelers feel more optimistic about life returning to normal or what we might call kind of near normal in the next six months. And uh, yet the recent surge in cases is resulting in American travelers feeling less likely to travel over the next three months. What we've seen here in Oregon simply is this, during calendar year 2020, just looking at what we would consider kind of a mid-range uh, forecast scenario, direct travel spending will decline from roughly $12.8 billion in 2019 to maybe a little over $5 billion in 2020. It's a 60% reduction over what we saw. And those impacts are going to be felt in the employment in the industry as well. We expect to see a decrease of about 37,000 jobs, a, in uh, Oregon's travel and tourism industry. That's a 31% decline year over year. Now we've seen some variation in the regional impacts. Uh, it, it, uh, the declines are not uh, the same all across the state. We have some regions that are actually seeing increases in hotel occupancy. We have some that are holding steady with what they saw last year. And we have some regions that are actually showing um, significant declines in um, in their occupancy. And Megan, I'm glad you're able to join us today because I know Portland is one that is really suffering mightily because of not only the decline in leisure travel, but also the loss of business meeting and convention uh, travel as, as well. So the perspectives that each of you are going to be able to bring as panelists is, is critically important uh, to us. So Jason, I'd love to turn it over to you to say a few opening comments as well. Okay, well, thank you so much, Todd. Uh, and yeah, we really appreciate the ongoing relationship as well. So thank you for the kind words earlier. And uh, we can accomplish a lot together as a state if we have that spirit of collaboration uh, and you know, hopefully win that race to recovery as much as possible uh, as we compete with other states uh, in the same mindset, you know, focus on those same strategies. Just to kind of explain the severity of the situation, though, in terms of economic impact, I wanted to share a couple stats. I don't want to lose everyone too much in numbers, but these are important national numbers for both restaurant and lodging as well as state numbers. Um, these sources are, are tried and true. So American Hotel and Lodging Association, the National Restaurant Association, and also the Oregon Employment Department, uh, just so you know where these numbers come from. Um, so in the lodging landscape um, at the national level, before COVID hit, jobs, direct jobs for lodging, 2,286,000. The jobs lost as of September, and remember these numbers are lagging numbers because it takes some while, a while to get the data. But out of 2.286 million jobs, we lost 871,000 lodging jobs in this nation. Uh, total pre-COVID supported jobs are about 8.3 million uh, before COVID. Jobs lost out of that 8.3 million, 1.91 million. Total, hot, total hotels uh, pre-COVID, 57,180. Estimated hotel foreclosures in our nation out of 57,000 roughly without congressional approval of another aid package, 28,000 hotel foreclosures out of 57,000. So that's a, a pretty big situation. Um, John Taponia recently joined us at Orla for an economic discussion about how this all plays out in Oregon. And uh, the reality is a lot of industry sectors have recovered to the point where they're about 5% behind on revenue compared to the same time last year. Whereas our industry broadly as a hospitality sector is more like 30% behind. So we're, we wanna make sure that we're doing whatever we can to, to make sure that we're not um, being left behind more than is necessary given the, the real effects of the virus and, and how we have to mitigate virus spread. 
national numbers for restaurants, National Restaurant Association. Some new research does point to the fact that a loyal customer base could help um, extend and hopefully stall any further job loss in the restaurant industry, which is exciting. So staffing levels uh, are about 2.1 million below normal levels uh, before COVID. So April, we lost about 5.4 million restaurant jobs in this nation, 5.4. We gained back out of the 5.4, about 3.3 million. And all of this, of course, are September numbers, so it doesn't include the latest surge and all the impacts that's had in states across this country. Now for our state, job status, November employment numbers. Um, this is uh, for accommodations and food service jobs. Spring loss, 97,300 jobs lost, 54% of our industry jobs. We gained back 64,300 and we still have 33,000 left to recover. And that's before the most recent two week freeze and before our new restrictions, which started today. So there's still a lot of unknown about those impacts. In the lodging side of things, so some of you will, you will hear more from uh, Aaron and Patrick in particular, it really has been a regional mixed bag across the state. Some people have had some record sales numbers in the fall. Uh, there was some pent up demand heading out of the, out of the summer, but um, pretty much in all instances, lodging operators haven't been able to recruit, recoup the amount of money they lost due to closures and consumer demand earlier in the season. So although they might be having a, a seasonal high, if you will, it doesn't mean that they're having a net gain based on the losses they had to endure earlier in the calendar year. On the restaurant side, about 50% of the sales that restaurants normally buy from their purveyors um, is about the norm. So if you're in the Portland region, this is um, about half of the food you buy from US Foods, Cisco, McDonald Wholesale, you're buying about half the food you, you bought at the same time last year. And as you go out of the Portland region, it's closer to 75%. Um, and that's uh, some stats that we've gotten recently. And again, before the freeze. So I uh, hope I went through that fast enough. Those are kind of the latest data points from an economic standpoint. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Todd to get us started on some questions. All right, Jason, thank you. You know, it's 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 good to just kind of take, uh, take a little bit of a, a opportunity to reflect on uh, where we were and what the impacts have been. So now we can we can uh, get into some of the individual stories. But I do want to touch on one thing that you said as I as I go to the first question, and that is the you know looking for those opportunities to continue to um, encourage the that what I'll call the generation of revenue for the hospitality industry businesses across the state. And one way to do that, and I just want to get this out there for everybody that's that's uh, joined us today for this webinar is uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the governor announced the, her Give the Gift of Oregon campaign. And it's something we've been able to work with Orla on. And I know Travel Portland is involved at, uh, at, at their community level. Several of our local and regional destination management organizations are involved at, at their uh, community level as well. Um, if you go to traveloregon.com, search for Give the Gift of Oregon, you'll be able to find opportunities where you can support hospitality businesses, local makers, um, wineries, breweries, uh, retail outlets, but you can also buy gift cards for future visits at lodging properties or meals at restaurants and, and the like as well. So uh, strongly encourage us as Oregonians to rally behind the businesses that make up Oregon's uh, travel and tourism industry and support fellow Oregonians in those, those positions. So Aaron, I'm gonna come to you with my, my first question. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of recapped the, the, you know, from, from whence we have come on this. And I, I'd love to just hear your insights, as I'm sure our uh, uh, attendees would as well. Um, how have you adapted your operations and the outreach that you're doing for visitors in light of COVID? Yeah, it's a really great question, Todd, and I appreciate very much that you opened your comments talking about the plight of small businesses because um, so much of our, our industry in Oregon is made up of small businesses. We're, we're a small business. The Atticus Hotel is 36 rooms. Um, our other two locations of Third Street Flats are 11 historic apartments. So we're, we're fundamentally 
um, a locally owned and operated um, small business. And I discovered at the start of COVID something that I had never realized before, which is that as it turns out, most of my peer group also works in the hospitality industry in wine or uh, restaurants. And uh, we all found ourselves in the same situation simultaneously. And of course our fates um, in McMinnville and in wine country are very much tied to food and beverage and what's happening there, we're a food and beverage destination. And you know the running joke um, after the initial shock wore off became, well, it's it's twice the work for half the money, and um, that's that's probably actually a somewhat generous comment, um, but uh, it it really is everything right now when it comes to hospitality is it's just twice as hard and. Um, we have an outstanding housekeeping team. We pride ourselves on our excellence in that department, but it is just a game changer when suddenly, you know, your team is sterilizing um, lobbies and workstations constantly throughout the days. And, um, you know, you have all these extra steps in your process. Um, our gym became single use only with cleanings in between, our elevator, our Bell Valley team, you know, no longer ri uh, rides the elevator with our guests. Everybody goes separately one at a time. And so even those smallest activities um, have become exponentially more complicated. And um, they're all small things, but together as a whole, they add up to be a lot. And when you're asking a team um, to deliver this warmth and hospitality um, at the same time that you're working really hard to keep a very sterile environment, and in some ways it almost starts to become this, this weird oxymoron, right, where you're balancing something very clinical and sterile with something very warm and inviting um, until you, you really understand that as being a part of caring for your guests. So it, it asks all of us to go back to the foundations of hospitality and that is to be incredibly guest centric, to offer an even higher level of service, to make everything individualized down to each guest. And I think that that um, asks creativity from business owners, it asks um, creativity from workers, and, um, but it does ask us to adapt and change in a, in a lot of ways while we continue to, to deliver the same high level of service. So. Aaron, that kind of reminds me of the duck along the water, you know, with the moving the feet underneath the water where no one can see. And that's all the protocols and the sanitation and this tedious yeah. thing that you got to do while staying calm, cool and collected and inviting people in with your warmth on, on the surface of the pond. Patrick, I'm just curious on your end. I mean, after the immediate decline because of the closures and some of the aspects of local government uh, restrictions and closures as well. What have you seen since then? What, what did the, the spring into the summer, into the fall, and, and now the holiday season, what does it look like out on the coast? Thank you. Um, Jason, let me just set the table a little bit with regards to that, because um, being at the coast, we were actually mandated to close seven of our properties uh, right before spring break. I mean, we were just geared up. We're coming out of the winter. We spent most of our cash on CapEx projects. And all of a sudden we're getting these cancellations and you know at the at the beach we charge in one night advance deposit and all of a sudden we're we're having to refund those deposits with zero cash in the bank so we're just hoarding cash like trying to figure it out and i think it was the right thing to do because we had to get our arms around it how to proceed and move forward um but for us we furloughed 400 plus employees and um again we were just hoarding cash uh we did a 25% across the board pay cut. We started negotiating with our bankers uh, for debt forbearance. Um, we started reducing non-essential vendor relationships and um, we applied for the payroll protection plan. I mean, that was actually a, a godsend to be honest with you. Um, but then we had to come up with an operations plan like Aaron suggested for best practices and protocols to move forward. And so, it was uh, for the first time in my business that I was like, are we going to get through this thing? I mean, we had, uh, we had to bring everybody back. And so um, then the back part was coming back with these new protocols in place, retraining staff, getting them to come back, encouraging them. And Aaron, to your point about housekeeping, I mean, you know, they're busting their butts wearing face masks and you look at them and, and they're sweating and they're like, you know, it, you have to have some empathy in this area. For what they're what they're doing so specifically to trends um for us you know the business travel dropped significantly um 
and the leisure stalled for sure. But it was interesting. There was so much pent up demand on the leisure side that we saw huge increases from July through October in the leisure markets. In fact, Jason, we are set up for a very strong November up until um, the freeze. And uh, you know, the business travel again in, in Portland, I, I can't imagine what they're going through. Our tertiary markets, um, the Dow's especially, Beaverton, they've, they've done okay. I mean, they're limping along. Um, and we're hoping to get that back. Yeah, our experience was really similar, Patrick. I would describe it as a roller coaster. We were ahead of 19 and ahead of budget for January and February. It was looking to be a great year. And then, you know, this huge drop, of course, um, when we closed everything down and then building back up over the summer. And then for us, um, we lost everything again during the fires. Um, when, you know, you, I know you know how this feels when you're paying somebody just to take cancellations. And we've now experienced that three times this year. Uh, and then we were also geared up for a really, you know, it was climbing up. We were recovering from the fires. We were gearing up for a really great November. And then the freeze just dropped us off a cliff again. So it has been um, for us just, we have had three moments this year where our business has gone from being strong to just right back down to the bottom again. A difficult year you, for sure. You know, Megan Patrick just made reference to you can only imagine what it's like in Portland. Why talk to us about Portland? Um, we we can see the numbers, but what are what are you hearing? I mean, as, as the you know, as a leader in the community, uh, you know, what do, what do you what are you sensing? What are you hearing that the, the businesses in 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 Portland are are really needing right now, and how has Travel Portland been able to adapt to uh, to be able to serve those businesses as, as best you can during this time? Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, you know, I think it, it some of what the businesses need is right in line with the gift the gift of Oregon, as you were talking about before, and some of it is as critical, but also as simple as supporting local businesses and choosing throughout, whether it's the holiday season or especially as we look at January, February, and March for people who have the means to be spending locally, whether that's shopping or dining or you know, even lodging or anything like that, that they are putting these dollars back into our community. When we look out at the future, um, you know, we're coming off of a year where we didn't necessarily see the uptick that some of the other communities around the state saw. We, we were thrilled that other parts of the state were seeing occupancy numbers that in some cases were higher than previous years, previous summers, different things like that. While we did see some level of uptick um, throughout the summer and into the early fall, things have, have really slowed back down from a standpoint of, of occupancies with, you know, our, our occupancies have been anywhere kind of going back and forth between the early stages where it was down to 10%, they were back up into the 30% ranges. And now with everything that's going on and the typical slowdown we see sometimes in the winter, we're hovering back down for the city center um, under 20%. So, you know, the critical need in the community is that our small businesses need our support and need to be able to make it out on the other side of this. And we know from a visitor standpoint, such a big piece of why people come to Portland and love it are the small businesses. It's the people that they get to go and talk to who are a maker or, you know, a shopkeeper or an owner or anything like that. And they are the people who make up the personalities of this city. And we've been so fortunate to have so much innovation and creativity and thoughtfulness and collaboration over the years. And we look to all of those things to be what will help move us forward on the other side. Um, I will say just one last thing on that topic, Aaron, the, the concept of paying people just to manage cancellations. You know, we look at, it, we've sort of had a year of tearing a lot of things down. We have, in addition to just the business and the leisure, the meeting side of things, which is a huge part of the business in Portland. Um, and our sales team has done so much work to postpone, to help people come up with other options, to do virtual meetings, to host virtual events for um, meeting planners and different things like that. So we've done a lot of tearing down, but we see a lot of hope around the building up that we've been able to do with these spend local, shop local, dine local, PDX to go, um, pushing, you know, takeout opportunities and different things for people. Uh, and really just trying to shift our focus from the outside audiences that we typically have talked to over the years to really pushing 
our mission to be locally driven until we get to a point that it's feasible for us to bring people back from outside. Yeah, uh, Megan, I mean, the way in which you and Travel Oregon continue to pivot is inspiring to us at Orla. I mean, it's there's so much that has to be done and there's so much pressure on all of us as leaders to make sure that we're doing everything possible to save these lodging and restaurant operations. And David, I, I wanted to get your, your take on some of this because when we were down in Southern Oregon recently in October, we were talking about uh, you and your wife and, and the ability to create customized group packages uh, for people to experience Oregon in, in really a, uh, a unique way. And I'm just curious what you think visitor sentiment is going to look like. What, what, are, what does that conversation look like between you and your wife these days as we get ready for 2021? Well, you know, it, it's been a difficult year uh, for everyone. Our business operates seven days a, a week uh, year round. And uh, so we're moving 25 to 30,000 people a year, taking them into restaurants and other businesses. So uh, when you lose 94, 95% of that business, it's a huge impact. Uh, but at the same time, we have to look to the future. And, you know, one of the things that I'd hope for the most is that for, you know, tour operators and other companies in the tourism industry to have gained a little bit more support from a funding standpoint. I was very happy to see actually at Tropical Oregon had made an initial intent, uh, intent to help uh, many businesses with some of the grants that they put out there. The fact is, it wasn't enough um, to get us all over the hurdle or into a readiness position to move forward. Uh, but as we look forward, Jason, you know, safety will be the number one priority. In fact, I love uh, one of the things that I see happening in uh, uh, with Travel Portland is that uh, they're working on with their conference conventions um, a certification for safety to, um, to help to support uh, that business. I would like to see us do something very similar statewide uh, to ensure that all the businesses, the communities are connected uh, from a safety standpoint. Because when we do move into 2021, uh, I believe this will help to restore that trust and confidence um, that we need both for domestic and future international travelers coming to the area. But I think the most important thing right now, Jason, is um, when we look at uh, the partnerships and collaboration, um, I've been very uh, impressed with some of the things happening right now. You know, for our company, we're not just looking at partnerships within our industry, but we're looking outside of our industry, trying to see how we can um, develop you know, new relationships that will help us as well. And I'll give you an example. Um, there's an organization in Portland, our Children for Oregon. Um, they reach out to every corner of the state to help kids, both from the state, from policies, the laws, to ensure that they have a voice. And when I look at the travelers, you know, both domestic and international, they're looking and making decisions on what destinations they're going to based off a big part of is, is what are the, what is the industry doing to give back to their communities? Um, I was down in Southern Oregon and shortly after uh, you and I met there and there was a gentleman by the name of David uh, Smith who uh, just took over as the AD of OSF Oregon Shakespeare. And he was working with uh, Newman Hotels and other partners and they had a panel discussion and, and they were sharing more about what they need to do moving forward to, to collaborate and work together to, more, not just for their business, but promote the entire uh, region and to help other businesses to recover in their area. Um, Jason, uh, Todd, um, Teresa O'Neill and Clinton Street uh, consultants with Michelle Lehman, I've been very impressed with the work that you guys have been doing with future leaders from around the state to help to train and develop them and get them ready um, looking at it, especially from a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens, because I think that's always been a huge opportunity for our state. So when you look at um, uh, 2021, I'm very hopeful that our recovery, it's, it's going to be a process, it's going to be slow, but I think that uh, if there's continued partnership, collaboration, work together, we'll get there. David, thank you. I, I... 
I appreciate the recognition of the, the work that's being done by many people across the state, especially in the DEI uh, space. It, um, you know, we, we all want to see an Oregon that is welcoming to all. And the Travel Oregon, our vision is a better life for all Oregonians through strong, sustainable local communities that welcome a diversity of explorers. And the work that we're doing with Orla on that Tourism Leadership uh, Academy is a way to do that for future leaders in the industry. And I appreciate your recognition of that. But more importantly, I appreciate your contribution to that because you've been there at every one of those sessions. You've been a participant on those panels. Um, and uh, you bring a, a, a valued and valuable perspective to that, uh, to, to all that work. You you mentioned earlier in your in in your some of your comments about the uh, the grant program from last spring that Travel Oregon put mm -hmm. out there and how the need was great, um, and the need is still great. I mean the 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 governor made uh, twenty million dollars available through Business Oregon and for small businesses. And those grant applications that were basically used up in, in about 22 minutes, 22 minutes, you know, and now there's an additional $55 million that's going out through, through counties uh, to support businesses and ask for, they're asking for an emphasis on hospitality businesses, restaurants, food service, uh, et cetera, um, to, to be able to uh, help uh, those businesses as, as well. I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear from each of you. I wanna just put this, this, uh, this question out to the panel in terms of uh, what kinds of investments or actions would aid from your perspective, businesses that you run and operate, what kinds of investments and actions would be beneficial to fueling a quicker recovery for Oregon's travel and tourism industry? And I'll just, I'll just put it out there. I'll jump in. Um, I, you know, I think it's, I think that that's a really great question, Todd, and I think it's one that we all need to consider. Um, I personally am a huge believer in the power of community banks. Um, if you don't bank with a community bank, you should. Um, money recirculates through our local economies, but also our relationship with our community banks um, have, ha it's been essential to getting through this. So, You've got obviously the employment piece here. We all know the situation with unemployment in the state of Oregon. Um, there are programs that I think are available um, to help hospitality firms keep their employees through the slow winter months, work share, et cetera, that, that we need to, to access. Um, but I really think for us to look at how we can empower banks or create incentives for local community banks to work with commercial landowners to be able to give them deferments with the caveat that those deferments are passed down to their tenants. And we've had a couple of local banks that have stepped up and, and done that in our community. And it's been huge. When you, when you look at your costs, your costs are, you know, a huge chunk of those are either coming from your your people and they're coming from your physical structure. So I think it's something that we can really do um, to look at look at creative ways to make that possible at both the state and a federal level to enable banks to pass on support from the actual commercial property. If you own your own building, wonderful deferments are fantastic when you know your buildings are largely empty um, or to ensure that those deferments are not just available but that they actually end up with the small businesses who are the tenants in these buildings. That would take a lot of pressure off of a winter that's going to be long um, and have a lot of fixed costs for, for small businesses that are going to be difficult to sustain. I think I'd add to that too, Todd. Um, you know, the governor's pause definitely had a negative impact on business and it's really not one size fits all. And that's kind of how I perceived it initially. Um, Orla does a great job with this, but the industry has to be at the table as a partner with government, not creating channels of dialogue and um, mutually developing solutions. And not just at the state level, but regionally and locally, it's critical that we have that dialogue. You know, um, I will say this, you know, when you look back at 2000, 
eight, nine, ten, um, you know, we were in a very critical situation then with the economy. Um, and the one thing that I was very avid, avid about is ensuring that we continue um, to market the destination. I think right now, you know, we have to do it very strategically, but at the same time, I think we have to continue to market the destination because there are businesses still open. And if we're going to have an opportunity really to compete um, with travelers as uh, things start to reopen, um, I think the marketing efforts have got to be um, started today and not tomorrow. And it's got to be a collaborative effort once again, statewide, very consistent, very strategic in our approach. Todd, I'll just add to that as well. Um, thank you. It's so good to hear the perspectives of the other panelists and, and get a little insight into that. Um, I will say from a Travel Portland standpoint, we had a grant program that we had launched right before um, COVID hit and the pandemic became a reality and all of that, that we had to actually unravel and pause and move on without awarding the dollars. And I think as we look at it, you know, we're an organization that's in the midst of um, looking for critical relief funds as we continue to go through this process as well. We're a 501c6. We are not included in um, a lot of the federal relief packages, much like any um, other GMOs that sit in that classification. And when we look at, you know, the opportunity where we used to be able to put a different level of community support through either grants or support of, um, you know, funding needs or things like that, both culturally, but also when we think about our events or, or other organizations, you know, right now we're sitting in a position where transient lodging tax and tourism improvement district collections are both down 85%. Um, we get a 1% portion of the city lodging tax, which is 6%. But when you think about it, the city general fund is also feeling that 85% loss of those collections. So when we look at it from that bigger economic standpoint, it's, it's not only the small businesses, but there are real gaps in funding that comes in typically from visitors coming into our community and spending money. We have a lot of conversations with partners who um, maybe hadn't necessarily thought of themselves as a tourism sector business before because they knew their local customers and they had a lot of locals that came in and that kind of thing. But once people really saw that what it looks like when we don't have travelers coming here, there's a different level of the industry in our sector that people understand, I think, a little bit differently. Um, and so it's critical as we look to recovery to really capitalize on the fact that we want to bring all of those people around the table and talk about David, as you're saying, what does that what does that marketing look like? Um, you know, we're behind the scenes doing the work so that we can be ready and move very quickly when things start to open up, and it feels like we can start inviting people from other areas, even if that's just regional to begin with. Uh, but it, it, there's there's a lot kind of of gap in between, so we're looking forward to working together on some of those solutions. Yeah, and speaking of solutions, I mean, we we have the prospect of a potential special session still in December. It's still a, ru a rumor going around that that might happen, plus the, the long six-month 2021 legislative session. And to Aaron's point, uh, uh, these deferrals are going to prove critical. I mean, if we care about holding on to the iconic independent restaurant and lodging scene across the state, we have to have an extension of our mortgage foreclosure um, moratorium, which expires on December 31st. We really need another six months to get us through the end of June. And we also need it for commercial evictions as well. So restaurant tenants and the like that, you know, need some more flexibility to line up investors and figure out how to get through the point at which these vaccines are widely distributed. I'm going to step in because I think I think Jason may have uh, may have froze there for a moment. So um, I will, uh, you know, I, I I'm curious as we as we you know we were talking a little bit about investments and actions. Obviously, this is all about an eye to the future. And David, you even mentioned you know what what transpired in 2008, nine, and ten. And um, you know, looking at Looking at our, our panel today, I know at least some of us, if not all of us, were, were here and involved in the travel and tourism uh, industry in Oregon during the Great Recession. Some may have also been involved in the industry 
uh, during 9-11. We've seen how tragedy, uh, both personal as well as an economic tragedy like the, like the Great Recession, can impact the travel and tourism industry and, and has uh, historically. And we've also seen how we've recovered uh, through that spirit of collaboration and how we've, how we've been able to come together uh, in that way. And I, uh, you know, as we, as, we, as we think about the recovery and we look to the future and we do so with, with uh, an, an element of hope and optimism, um, you know, I was going to ask David and, and Megan, I know you're both uh, organizationally business-wise or personally involved in kind of both domestic and international markets. And uh, recovery is looked at to be a little different in, in both of those spheres. And I'd um, really like to hear from you how you see um, uh, the recovery best moving forward from that, uh, you know, the domestic aspect as well as that international recovery, the things that you're hearing, you know, kind of that ear to the ground uh, that would be beneficial for us to be able to talk about today. David, I can start and then we can kind of go back and forth if that works. Um, you know, we look at recovery and talk about it from sort of a concentric circle standpoint. That's probably not surprising to anybody, but we do feel like we can, um, you know, lean into some of the areas surrounding Portland, the West Coast, and then extend beyond there out into the rest of the country. We do stay in very close contact with our partners and friends at the Port of Portland and are staying abreast of any news around um, direct service, both domestically being added back to different markets, which are critical to you know, business service and different things like that, as well as leisure, but then also keeping our eye on the potential that international flight service um, is out there and when that might be able to return as well. When we look at key markets from a Portland standpoint, um, the connector markets of the Japan flights that we've had in the past and getting those back is critical to the Asian markets, but then also um, the connection to the Netherlands and what that does to kind of branch out into the European markets. So we have been engaged from an international tourism standpoint in a number of um, marketplaces with tour operators and folks that are, you know, doing the good work to keep an eye on all of the destinations in the United States as they think about how to open their businesses and kind of fleets of travelers coming back out into the marketplace. And the, the feelings are positive, um, certainly. And we've had very good and positive meetings in those, um, in those marketplaces. David, I don't know if you've joined in any of those, um, but I know you have many, many international connections and I'm sure you have plenty to add as well. Um, thanks, Megan. No, I have not joined in on those, but you know, Todd, I, I just like to tell you this. Um, as it relates to Portland. The perception of Port, Portland is so critical because no matter what we say, it does have an inflect, a reflection on the rest of the state. So what we do to, um, from a marketing standpoint, what we do to, 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 to clean up uh, some of parts of the city, uh, what we do to support the homeless, you know, there's, there's several things that we, have to continue to look at and address. And I know a lot of these things are being addressed, addressed right now, but I think it's incredible because I'm hearing that uh, there's still such a, an interest in coming to Oregon. And that intent to travel, both domestic and international is so critical. I, kn I know as a, uh, due to the situation, we really have to take it one step at a time and focus on the local domestic travelers and continue to um, you know, move forward from there. So it may be a while before we really uh, do a lot in the international market moving forward again, although it is a very uh, key market for us. You know, for my business, for example, um, the, the late fall, the winter season, the international market was so critical because you know, most of the domestic travelers, the spring, summer is over, the kids are all back in school, they're not traveling. So they're both markets are equally important. And so we have to continue to market to both as well. But we've got some work to do here statewide. And you know, one thing I, I'd like to see as we continue to move forward, but um, earlier I was um, online trying to see where I could find a website that, um, would allow me to see what the restrictions were 
um, throughout the state of Oregon or other states. I would like to see at some point within the state of Oregon, there's one website that every region, every partner could have a link to that is just the one place visitors will go to gather information on what restrictions and what's new, um, what's new out there. Because we, we know that from country to country, um, or even here within the United States, from state to state, there may be different requirements. We'd like to see that there's a more consistency, but in fact, is when you look at the airlines, um, you know, with the uh, passport, for example, there's a lot of discussion going on at this point um, in terms of how that the passport may be connected to uh, the, the vaccine, you know, requirements. We don't know what the requirements are. And so we just have to stay very flexible and be very adaptable to the changes that we see uh, moving forward. Um, I lost you all there for a second. Can you hear me again? Yes, we can, Jason. Okay. Todd, can uh, I sorry about that. I'm thinking about doing a freeze and pretending like I'm frozen again, but I don't want to add too much humor to this. This is important stuff. So yeah. I was talking a little bit about, you know, special session and the, the regular session, you know, of, uh, a continuation of the commercial mortgage moratorium as well as commercial evictions. And I just want to hear a little bit more from Patrick and Aaron, as well as David and Megan, as they, as they wish to chime in. But our restaurant scene, how, how are we going to recover in your eyes? Uh, Aaron, with your colleagues, you mentioned you have restaurant operators that are close friends. Patrick, you have units that are, that are restaurants within your portfolio. What are we going to do to get through these crazy months, which are always the worst for sales, January, February coming up? It's, you know, it is a really challenging situation on the restaurant front. Our, our future is always um, inextricably linked with the restaurants in our community because we are fundamentally a, a dining, a wine and dining destination. And um, we've lost a couple of really fantastic restaurants in McMinnville um, already. Uh, we have had a new restaurant that was slated to open and did open in the middle of, of um, the pandemic. So, you know, there, there are things coming and going both directions. Um, but it's really difficult. You know, our, uh, the core of our, our tourism based restaurants are located in a historic downtown and, and what you find very quickly is that the layout of your physical space defines in so many ways how successful you can be um, when suddenly, you know, you have a very, for example, long and narrow space and it's very difficult to space tables out and have people six feet apart and your occupancy is not really falling by 50%, you know, maybe it's falling by 75%. You don't have outdoor space when you're in a historic downtown necessarily. Um, and so it's really challenging. And that's where, you know, when I'm speaking to trying to get rent relief, um, you know, actual relief down to people through deferments. Um, and, and the moratorium on eviction is wonderful, but, you know, the bill comes due eventually and you're not making money during these times. So I think that there's um, ways that that can all be structured really thoughtfully. Um, our partner restaurant in the Atticus Hotel is Red Hills Kitchen. Jody Kropp and his team um, have Red Hills Market in Dundee, which is just a wine country institution as well. They're so creative. Um, uh, in 12 minutes, in fact, um, they, uh, Red Hills Kitchen will be opening a permanent pop-up in our parking lot. So we've given up all of our parking actually to enable uh, the restaurant to put up a big tent, bring out heaters, tables, um, create that atmosphere outside, but logistically within McMinnville, you know, there's only a handful of restaurants that even have the space to be able to, to do that with outside dining. So it, there is no way that we're not going to see more losses on the restaurant front um, unless there is really serious action. PPP is wonderful. Um, our team was so excited today. Our forgiveness actually just came through today. So that's wonderful. Um, but that was set to cover a 10 week period. And this crisis has obviously lasted much, 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 much longer than that. And so there has to be meaningful relief when we have government regulation that's coming down that is making it almost impossible for businesses to stay open for the common good, we have to pass along the support to allow those businesses who are sacrificing their livelihoods, their savings accounts, 
um, and everything else, we have to follow up with the support to help them through this time. And there are businesses that are doing very well. Um, hospitality is the lifeblood of a lot of communities and we have to get the money to the restaurants in particular um, and, and hotels as well. But these little guys, we have to help them survive. All of the little guys, all of us small businesses, there has to be more support from both the state and federal level. I would completely agree with Aaron's comment. And Jason, as you know, the margins in the restaurant business are so marginal anyway, especially in an environment like Oregon with the tax structure and the lack of um, you know, uh, tip credit. It's just been tough. And I'm, I, I can't imagine what some of our partners are going through. And it's, it's sad. When David Machado shuts down five of the best restaurants in downtown Portland, it's like, wow, that's huge. Um, you know, we've adapted where we've changed our point of sale system to, to really focus on takeout friendly. But even then, um, we did a social media blitz. We pushed it ourselves when before dining, we we're still down 75%. And once we were allowed to get customers back in line, for example, our restaurant in the Dalles, Cousins, um, that was a $4 million annual sales with new restrictions and protocols in place. We were a two and a half million dollar restaurant this year. Um, and not only that, what it does to our employees and their families. I mean, we have a responsibility to them. So some, finding out some type of subsidy to accommodate them to get us through this is gonna be critical. Um, and I, I think the other thing is just, again, we just like the hotel side, as Erin mentioned, we need to focus on cleanliness and best practices protocols to keep to meet to exceed guest expectations. And so when they do come to your place, they feel comfortable because there are people out there that even when we had dining available, we're like, eh, do I really want to go to that place? Are they really following the protocols? Jason, um, I'll just add, we have just over the last couple of weeks launched a safety pledge from Travel Portland that businesses can sign on to. So Patrick, sort of alluding to some of that piece that you're saying, um, you know, people can sign on to be adhering to what the current levels of protocols are, the mask mandates, all of that type of thing. And we see that really as something that's an ongoing mission so that as meetings and leisure travel does start to come back, people have a checkpoint that they can look at to say, okay, this is great. Jason, I know you all have your um, program as well for certifications and safety and cleanliness certifications and that type of thing which is really critical. Um, and I will also add that, you know, uh, the, the success and livelihood of the restaurants in Portland is extremely important to us as Travel Portland and, and really of the restaurants around the state. We all know that, you know, our research shows, any research would show the darling that our city and state have been of the New York Times food section and other media outlets, there, there is a reality to the fact that Portland and Oregon are these amazing um, destinations for food and the ingredients that our chefs work with and all of that. We've already seen significant loss in this area. We're thrilled that Multnomah County is using some of the dollars allocated by the governor to put those directly into the hands of restaurants uh, and food carts, which is another critical piece for us. Um, and the last thing I'll just add, building on what David was talking about before with the perception piece, you know, nobody on this call or <laughs> who we talked to would be surprised that in our most recent research that we've done, um, from Q1 of 2020 to Q4 of 2020, we saw a significant uptick from 30 to 70 percent of people who had seen Portland in the news media, and about a similar size growth of people who felt the coverage they had seen was negative. But to share some positive news on the research that we do and what we've seen, the real bright spot within the research was that, and this really wasn't surprising to us because we know that once people have been here, they, they get it, um, was that we really didn't see much of a decline in people who have been to Portland before wanting to come back. Um, so when the time is right, people are going to be ready and they're going to want to see what these places that they've been to and have loved look like. And we know that the critical work that we do around the marketing, as David was talking about, and other things will be in finding and reaching those people that still see us as this beautiful, viable, vibrant destination that they want to experience. So that's the work of the work that we'll continue to do. Yes, and Jason, um, like everybody here, um, I hope that there was more relief for all the restaurants and businesses out there. It is very sad. Um, but, but with that said, 
um, you know, for a company like ours, uh, we we sustained some incredible uh, losses. I mean, when you're running 25,000 plus 30,000 people and taking them to restaurants and what have you, uh, that's a major impacts. And we've received calls from businesses uh, from the start of this uh, pandemic up until current day from businesses. So we're just hoping to be in a readiness position when the time is right and we can start taking um, our guests back out into the restaurants. But uh, at this point right now, all I can do is hope that as many as possible can survive and hopefully there'll be more relief on the way to help the ones that are still um, in business today. Yeah. Thank you all. I know we've got just a just a few minutes left, and you know we talk about how the industry has been so um, so impacted, and we've made reference to several different types. I've recently become aware. In fact, I I, I applaud uh, some colleagues that have sent me a couple of messages during our our webinar that have referenced a, a fairly young organization called the Live Events Industry of Oregon. They're talking about how eighty percent of their members have lost eighty percent of their revenue during the the pandemic. So again, another aspect of the visitor experience that makes Oregon so vibrant at unique live event scene as well, um, being impacted. I'd, I'd love to just put this out to the group, a bit, maybe a bit of a round, uh, round robin um, with two aspects. And that is pull this all together. Think about what, what you've learned since uh, our our first case of COVID-19 hit, hit Oregon last year and the subsequent steps that have been, that have been taken to mitigate the spread and, and, and such. What, what is either you know, a lesson that you have learned that's going to inform how you go into approaching your business in 2021 or something that you hope a policymaker or leader could glean from this experience so that they're better informed, better apprised, better aware of how they can support communities and the hospitality businesses that do make up the fabric of the travel and tourism industry in Oregon. Erin, can we just start with you? Sure. I, you know, I think that there's been a lot of learning this year and, um, for us, when it comes to future growth, I think that we have been reminded that cash is king um, and really having being well capitalized. And we were lucky to go into this crisis well capitalized. But as we evaluate future growth and future projects, really looking carefully at um, the margin of return and making sure that we are not growing uh, in ways that are overly ambitious, but are, are skinny on the return side because you have to be well capitalized when suddenly there's a global pandemic. So, you know, I think that there are things that we, we all learned in personal finance and in high school, but it's so tried and true when it comes to, to having that cash on hand and it's, um, you know, capitalization and that relationship uh, with our community bank. Um, we have two commercial buildings that we own. We have two different community banks we work with. They've both been absolutely incredible um, partners, knowing that this is a dark time, but we're going to make it out on the other side and believing in us, believing in our business and um, giving us uh, deferments and one of our commercial buildings where we have other tenants, we did pass those down in terms of rent relief. Um, other landlords did the same. Um, and I, I think that that's something that we have to continue to think about. And it's, it's definitely those relationships um, and, and the value of, of capital, certainly um, are big lessons for me from this situation. Yeah, a huge one for me, guys, is, um, you know, just this perceived lack of civility and discourse. And it's beyond our industry, it affects our culture. You, people are fearful and they've got uncertainties and unfulfilled expectations, but you know, how do we impact culture for the better? Um, we just had our managers meeting that we do twice a year. Um, and the focus was gratitude and what are we thankful for? And, and how can we, it sounds kind of crazy, but how can we sincerely perform intentional random acts of kindness within our personal fear of influence? And, and make it a better world. And so I, we kind of, it's a mindset, you have to seek it. And I think in hospitality, 
we have that orientation for the most part, but our culture has gotten so contentious that if we don't start changing the way we respond to others and lift them up, we're, we're gonna be in for a world of hurt. Yes, I agree. And I would just like to chime in and say that, you know, from a business standpoint, you know, we thought we were working really hard to cut our burn rate early, but it still wasn't enough. And, and it was very challenging for us to get to where we are at this point. But with that said, we've learned that you know, being more flexible and staying adapt, uh, ability to adapt, knowing that there's more changes, uh, more requirements, things are going to, to continue to change. Um, but I think what I've learned the most is simply that I do care about my community. I care about my state. And it's going to, um, it's, it's, it's going to force me to work even harder to ensure that the economic impact of tourism recovers and it reaches and helps every corner of this state. That's what's important to me. And I think I have more of a commitment today than I did prior to uh, COVID-19. I'll just add quickly, um, because I know we're coming up against time, but you know, I think that there's been, there's been a year of grieving for all of us, whether it was employees that we lost or it was um, you know, kind of looking around and thinking, is our, is our destination the same? Is it gonna come back? And the reality is it's not, it's gonna be a very different place. And that's okay, because when we look back at certain things, I think we need to really reflect on, did everybody have the same chair at the table? And have we done enough for our houseless communities? And ways that we can come back and be a better, stronger looking community um, that are critical to the recovery as well as we look at, you know, how do we build back better and how do we look at the future and invite not only our local community members into what that kind of renaissance looks like, but how do we welcome visitors back into that as well so that they can see that the recovery efforts and the work has been collaborative and extremely thoughtful. Well, thank you all so much for those closing comments. Um, I think these are the reasons why we're going to be successful in turning this corner. I mean, people like you that are in the leadership positions that you're in. And together, I know that uh, we will have a, a positive recovery. It might not take uh, as short amount of time as we want, but if we, if we stay true to each other and continue to provide constructive criticism and push ourselves forward, I know we can get there. So a huge thanks to Megan, David, Aaron, and Patrick for joining us today. To our co-facilitator, Mr. Todd Davidson, and the professional staff at Travel Oregon that put this all together. Remember that this is the last industry cluster session um, as we prepare for the unveiling of the Oregon business plan that will be released uh, December 14th at 1 p.m. We thank you all so much again for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.